why digital technology is different from all the other applications of superconductivity. And probably the main thing is that we just have so many devices. So people are talking about uh, 100,000 million junctions on a chip, and that makes it a completely different uh, category from squids. Typical technology currently is something of the order of 10 to 50 junctions, and that already is quite an achievement if one can do this. The first period of superconducting of uh, digital electronics used voltage state, zero and one states of the Josephson junctions. In the early 1980s, there were some very important uh, fabrication developments. The idea of uh, the aluminum oxide uh, barrier, niobium junctions, came at that time. The uh, sandwich type, uh, I believe, is the one that's most controllable. And control is an extremely important thing when you have, are going to have 100,000 junctions. You just can't tolerate a lot of spread. So uh, the most success has been had with, uh, with sandwich type junctions. The margins on the digital circuits are small. People that are working on holy Josephson memories are trying to fit 16 kilobits in a centimeter squared and we can fit 64 kilobits in two millimeters squared. Now, there's no gain, unlike uh, transistor circuits, and there's uh, a lack of adequate memory at this point. The other material that's been talked about already is magnesium diboride. The 40 Kelvin is nice if you could actually make circuits and junctions and operate them at 20 Kelvin. That would be nice, but the situation is that we're not there. For a long time, people, uh, promoters of this technology, the HITC high technology, had the idea that they were going to operate at somewhere up around 45 Kelvin or more because, look, the transition temperature is 90, so the usual, this usual rule of operating at a half or two-thirds of TC said that you could do that. But in fact, uh, what happens is that there's too much noise from that thermal noise at that temperature. And we did a series of uh, numerical simulations and found that the error rates are excessive if you're above about t equal 30. So we need a breakthrough. We need you guys, young guys, girls, ladies, excuse me, uh, to invent the equivalent of the aluminum oxide niobium junction. And then we can work up at higher temperatures. In 1985, there was a first publication about RSFQ circuits. It came out in a, an internal Moscow University publication. I will discuss about the system concept with SFQ devices, including packaging and cryogenics. Why SFQ systems are needed? What kind of problems we are trying to uh, solve is uh, two items. One is the power consumption, and the other is the high-speed operation. This figure shows the power consumption uh, total in a year in Japan, including uh, air conditioning systems. In total, more than 300 billion kilowatt hour in a, in a year. The other problem is a congestion due to rapid increase of communication traffic. This graph shows the increase of the data communication as a function of year. We should store all of the information in the hard disk system. 100, 100 million sets of 160 gigabyte hard disk systems are necessary. So you can imagine how large it is. And if we should exchange all of the information in a year, it, it is 4 terabit per second in average. The fastest router presently available can treat only 1 terabit per second. This is an average value. So in the peak value, a few hundred terabit per second router is necessary. But someone says, uh, uh, in the age of two, 2010, 20 terabit routers may be necessary. If no one can develop such a high-speed router, what happens? Answer is quite simple. World Wide Web becomes World Wide Waiting. 
<laughs> Low power nature of the SFQ is very important. Power consumption of SFQ LSI is extremely small. But of course, refrigeration power should be included, taken into account. 4x4 SFQ chip is mounted on the rack. The distinctive pumping sound comes from the cryocooler. Here is a series of magnetic, thermal and vacuum shields essential for correct operation of SFQ. SFQ LSIs can be operated with a clock frequency of a few tens gigahertz as a global clock. So SF, SFQ LSIs can be 100 times faster than semiconductor LSIs. Semiconductor devices are operated on the same clock frequency on the whole chip. But in the case of SFQ circuit, uh, several uh, clock cycles are necessary from edge to edge propagation. This is completely different from semiconductor devices. This illustration is very simplified. Actually, uh, many signal runs in the uh, circuit, so much more complicated. Imagine you have all these single flux quantum pulses running around through your circuit, and your first thing is, boy, if these are only a picosecond long, how can I get them in that circuit right at the within one picosecond and uh, so that they'll interact with each other. And of course, that's not the way it works. Uh, this is a gate, it's an OR gate, has several possible inputs. Uh, and then there's a timing or a clock pulse that comes in. So there's a pulse that comes in uh, at a time period, uh, which is the clock period. Basically, the idea is that if one of these pulses comes in any time during that clock period, uh, then that's considered a 1 going into the circuit. If nothing comes in on S2, uh, that's considered putting in a 0. So you can put in 1s and zeros. And then in this case, it's an OR gate, so you get an output. Semiconductors are good at high temperatures and high densities. Superconductors are good at lower temperatures and lower densities. So what one can do is we can combine the best of two worlds uh, just by bringing together superconducting chips and semiconductor chips. The output signal of this circuit is a bit density modulated bit stream. This would be then amplified in gallium azonite by a cooled amplifier this line would go on to room temperature, to indium phosphide, and then from there to, in principle very slow but high density, decimation filter in CMOS technology. So this would mean that from the high TC device to the CMOS device, we would cover the temperature array from about 30 Kelvin to room temperature. The combination of semiconductor devices and superconductor devices would give us here the necessary complexity on the right side and the necessary speed on the left side. The whole device would be without competition from the semiconductor field because in semiconductors it's very difficult to make analog digital converters with the necessary linearity and also uh, the necessary stability. For instance, gallium arsenide or uh, indium phosphide transistors can be very, very fast. They can operate above 100 gigahertz, but they become also very hot. They have quite a lot of uh, power consumption, and that means if one would make a circuit of, of comparable frequency, uh, it would simply melt the substrate. With superconducting devices, we not only have the speed and the power advantage, but also we have a natural uh, measure in it, that's the flux quantum. And the flux quantum is a very nice feature. It is big enough so that we can use it in contrast to electrons in semiconductor devices. But on the other hand, it's small enough 
so that we can really work with it. One tries to get a digital readout to the analog squared. The origin of the acronym, this is a superconducting quantum, because it has quantum behavior, it involves the flux quantum, interference device, and interference as in the optics case. The analog squared is uh, characterized by a very high sensitivity and a huge dynamic range, which we can plug into a computer and which gives this huge dynamic range, maybe something of the order of 30 bits resolution or even more, and on the other hand, the stability and sensitivity of the analog squared. And this would actually open new areas uh, for applications. One of the areas would be, for instance, uh, the detection 